Maria Manuela Goyanes. I am the artistic director of Woolly Mammoth Theater Company. And hello, everyone. My name is Douglas Buell, and I am the executive director of the Atlas Performing Arts Center. <laughs> Yay! Thank you for joining us, and thank you to Mayor Muriel Bowser and Director Angie Gates for allowing us to celebrate, support, and educate the district's creatives through 202 Creates. So Maria, I think it's time to get into it and start having a little conversation one-on-one -on -one and uh, together to talk a little bit about ourselves, our past, our history, and the work that we do here in the creative capital of the United States, the District of Columbia. <laughs> so um, I think what I'll do just to get us started is I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, I've been a part of the DC art scene probably as early as 1982 when mm -hmm. I moved here as um, a young college graduate and then uh, spent most of the 80s uh, working in retail management. But after that stint, um, I actually decided, you know what, uh, I'm an artist at the core. I believe in the uh, creativity. I believe in the work. Um, I want to do this uh, for the rest of my life, and I want to dedicate my life to it. So I quit my day job um, and began working um, in dance. Dance is my art form. And uh, fast forward about uh, 25 years later, um, after that stint, I served as the executive director of Joy of Motion Dance Center, um, a dance institution here in the District of Columbia for, for, for many, many years, now over 40 years, but said 25 years as its executive director. Then uh, fast forward to 2014, um, opportunity came available to lead the Atlas Performing Arts Center as its executive director. And I thought, you know what? Opportunity only knocks when opportunity means to knock. So I should listen to the call and um, left my career in dance specifically in dance education with joy and became the executive director here at the Atlas. And I must say, since that point in time, I've never looked back. It is just a great honor and a great pleasure to be involved in so many creative initiatives and activities here in the District of Columbia. So more power to the creative economy and more power to the art that we all create here. Amen to that. Um, I am a newer transplant to Washington, D.C., but I am a proud Washingtonian with three years under my belt, including a pandemic. And I moved to the district from New York City. I am from Jamaica, Queens. Um, I am Latina. I have the hoop earrings from Jamaica, Queens to prove it. Um, and I... Uh, I am the daughter of immigrants. My dad is from Spain and my mother's from the Dominican Republic. And so I consider myself Spaninican. Um, I got here to uh, run Woolly Mammoth Theater Company, I, uh, which was founded over now 42 years ago. I'm only the second ever artistic director because I followed a founder, Howard Shalwitz, uh, who decided uh, 42 years ago that Washington DC needed an alternative kind of theater. Uh, and since Woolly Mammoth was born. Uh, before Woolly Mammoth, I worked at the public theater in New York City for almost 15 years. Uh, yes, I worked on Hamilton. Yes, I was in the room where it happened. I also worked at Shakespeare in the Park and I have a lot of great stories of all of the amazing productions that I got to work on there. Um, that said, I love being in Washington, D.C. I find that the creativity, the ecology, the vibrancy, the dynamism of this city uh, really feeds the theater and feeds me. Um, so I'm really excited to be talking to you, Doug, because you've been here for so long and I feel like I'm pretty new still. Um, and so I uh, yeah, I can't wait to just get into the conversation. So first and foremost, you talked a little bit about this, but like, how did you get started? Well, I, I think when I mentioned I moved here, uh, dance was my art form and I just began taking dance classes and studying. And then from that opportunity, different um, performance opportunities presented themselves and really spent a lot of my free time or all of my extracurricular time dancing, whether it be performing, teaching, or rehearsing, taking class, and so on and so forth. Uh, as I mentioned, I had a, uh, a retail management career here in the 80s, and uh, as fulfilling and as wonderful as that was, and what it taught me from a business perspective, I'll never forget, I always cherish. But 
you know, when it comes to art, there's something inside of us where we we have to we have to discover more. We have to do more. And so I um, I made a huge decision to leave all of that and really pursue my uh, art as a as an endeavor. Little did I know that it actually would sort of steamroll quite quickly into a uh, a directorship and a managerial role that continued to propel me forward for for many many years. Mm-hmm. And the organization I was a part of, uh, Joy of Motion, at that time was a one room dance studio. Oh wow. And, over the, it took several years, over 25 years, grew into a multi-location, multi-studio facility um, with a tremendous amount of outreach and uh, programming for the community and uh, was just an amazing, amazing endeavor, something I've been very proud of. And again, lessons learned from all of that um, about how to make dance and how to make art happen in the District of Columbia uh, has just been a great life lesson. So I got started by just doing it, by being a part of it, by um, being as involved and as entrenched as I possibly could. And from that, you meet people, you grow, you learn, you do. And it just, again, remaining sort of true to intent um, to do as much as I possibly could with my art kind of continued to uh, inform me and lead me to where I am today. It's amazing. It's sometimes never a direct path. It's uh, sometimes maybe a defined path, but ultimately by holding true to intent and holding true to your passion, um, ultimately, I found, at least for me, it's led me in the right direction. Yeah, so, amen to that. Yeah. I, you know, I I was actually um, interested to know if you're still dancing. You know, good question. Um, I probably nowhere near to the degree that I used to dance. Uh, many people would be quite surprised and shocked. Um, I do dance just ever so slightly, but uh, it is, uh, as they say, I sometimes, I spend a lot of my life behind a desk now, which is just, one could consider that dancing in a certain way, but not to any, the level of physicality. It's a different kind of, yeah, there's a different kind of dance. It's the fundraising dance. It's the producing dance. It's the, yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's an interesting thing because I, there's an element of me missing that certainly, but um, I, I will say that when I, a lot of what I did was choreography. And when I found myself in a world of uh, organizational development and structure and so on and so forth and trying to figure it out, one of my great stories is I, I remember um, being so confused. What am I going to do? What's the staffing? What are the staffing needs? How do I do this? How do I make that happen? And I remember a dear friend of mine said to me, she says, well, well Doug, I mean, how do you how do you choreograph? How how do you approach your choreography? And on one level, I thought, well, you know, it's something that flows and comes from me. It just, I don't know. I just do it. So she said to me, well, then why don't you choreograph this organization? And when she said that, it the light bulb moment went off. I went, yeah. and I thought, oh my God, I'll just choreograph it. Because an organization is nothing but people and moving parts. So it was uh, it was a, one of those light bulb moments, great opportunities. And then after that, boom, it all happened. It all made sense. And and, you know, the, I would just you give into the flow and you give into the work and, and ultimately good things. Good things come from it. So. Um, so, no, your question was, do I still dance? Uh, not as much. But do I choreograph organizations and do I still remain in a creative light? Absolutely. But Maria, so back to you, right back at you. How did you get started in this wonderful world of art and theater? Oh, my Lord. Um, I I was always a reader, you know, so I was always just like with my nose in a book. Mm -hmm. And I went to Bronx High School of Science in New York, which is a science school. Um, But our English teacher, uh, Ms. Blattner, uh, took us into the city to see shows and to talk about them. And I remember sitting there and I was just like, oh my God, this is like books on stage. This is amazing. And you can tell people what to do. I'm like, I'm the older sister. I totally love being bossy. And it was like, this is great. I could be, I could do this. I could, I could, you know, um, have my imagination. It just like opened up my imagination just to be there and see that. But, you know, for me, I didn't, 
growing up as a, as a first generation American, I, I didn't see myself as somebody who could go into the theater as a practitioner. I didn't even know what jobs existed in the theater. I didn't even understand what that was like, you know? And so when I went to college, I was sort of, I got into a, with a theater troupe, but I just assumed that I would like, you know, come back to Queens. I don't get a business degree, probably can work at a bank, you know, have a bunch of kids, you know, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And something happened for me when I was working in um, in college where I I ended up being the person who was like organizing everything very similar to you and your like choreograph and organization. I was like, oh, I, I'm the person who actually like makes the stuff happen here. Mm-hmm. And um, somebody was like, yeah, that's producing. And I was like, huh, really? You can get paid to do this? <laughs> no idea. Right. Um, and so I, I just sort of set out to try to figure out, I gave myself a year after um, college because, you know, I don't come from a lot of money. I didn't, I, I was like, I've got to be able to make money. I don't want to ask my parents for money. They all don't want me to go into the theater. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. so I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to take this internship at Trinity Repertory Company in Providence, Rhode Island that pay, gave you housing and gave you a like small $60 a week stipend. And I was like, I don't have to ask my parents for money. I can live on $60 a week in housing. I was like, okay, a lot of ramen. Um, and I, and And I had a great time at this internship. And then, you know, almost a year to the day, I was offered a job there. And the job was like an insane job. It was like one of those titles that was like associate producer. But for a 22 year old, you, you, you know, I wasn't making even minimum wage at that moment or whatever, but I got a highfalutin title for all the work that I, you know, was, was trying to make happen. And it was amazing. And so Mm -hmm. that was where, that was where it all happened for me. That's where, where it started. And that's where I met Oscar Eustace, who, now runs the public theater. I actually got there before he did. Um, I was hired by George Wolf, who was the predecessor to Oscar. And then, um, but then Oscar got the job and I hadn't, I hadn't burned that bridge. And so I got to stay and work my way up at the public. I didn't, um, I didn't feel like I needed to leave the public. I, I love New York. I love, um, you know, my home, my family is there, but I have to say, Willie Mammoth is one of those special theater companies. And I really was like, this is, this is so rare. It's a rare kind of company that can take the kind of risks on, you know, pushing the content of the art form, pushing the boundaries of what it is that, what theater means and what it could be in a community, but even to the industry itself, you know, and I, and I couldn't help but think that like, maybe it was time for me to, to, um, to run a company. And so mm-hmm. I thought maybe Willie Mammoth would be the one that I would try. Yeah. And um, so far I feel really lucky to be here. Yeah, I, you, you've mentioned a couple of things just about your, the experience as a Latina, and even I might say as a, a, a woman, as a female in a theater industry that in many ways could be somewhat male dominated. I just, I'm, and I, you made me think about something to maybe share on my side, but I think back about discovery of self as you've gone through your, your life and your process um, to actually realize who you are and be empowered by who you are. And then how has that ultimately informed you? It seems like it's, it's, it's informed you really well and it's led you to great things, um, been to a leadership role. But I don't know, the struggles, any struggles, trials, tribulations with being a Latina and an American society, culture, as well as a female in the theater world. Yeah, I mean, we we all can write books, right? I mean, I, I guess what I will say is I have a very different skin experience from my darker skin brothers and sisters in the Latin A community, right? And so I walk around with a certain kind of privilege because I am so, because of my proximity to whiteness. Right. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately, um, even if I'm going to talk about challenges, it's really hard to, to talk about them in relationship to, um, to, to things like racism, because I know that I I have a, a definitely different skin experience. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I will say is like, I absolutely have been the token. I absolutely have, <laughs> have, have had to sort of, you know, say things multiple times to be heard or, or have a man have to say it to, for, to be heard or, you know, various things like that. I, I definitely have those experiences. Um, but for better or for worse, I've, I've always been an, an optimist. And so I, there's something about the theater for me, um, 
art really, but really for me, it was the theater because of communicating stories and, you know, and trying to elicit some emotions from people based on sort of a story that is kind of, that is, you know, reflecting or refracting what is happening in the world around us. Right. I, I don't know. I, I've always, I've always felt like I've been really lucky to be a part of it, to be honest. Uh Um, And I think that that's why I go back to this thing of like, I have like a parallel life in another universe that I wouldn't be going to doing the theater and I get to do it in this life. Uh And, um, and so that's what I've been sort of living with, but I'm curious, what, what, what was sparked for you in the way that I was chatting? It's it's interesting how, when you have conversations, different things come to mind. And I think um, this whole conversation started to remind me of, again, the, the concept of discovery of self. And I think that, One of the experiences that I had um, once moving to the district and after school and college was um, coming to terms and being at home with the fact that I'm a gay male um, in society. And I found that uh, my initial sort of career was in a world where being who I truly was was definitely not something that was celebrated and definitely not something that you even talked about or mentioned. And I think another great thing about moving into the world of dance or moving into my art was an opportunity or an experience where the moment I said that and I did that and I was within a community of people, the concept of these labels and tags totally disappeared. And it was just the ability to be who I am, I believe, sort of my authentic self and not have to question or wonder or be concerned about how do I fit in because I was already accepted. And I I just haven't thought about this in a long time. And I, it really was, I think, a, a very powerful thing for me and experience at that point in time. And a part of why I started making, you, know, you make these decisions in life as you move through where you start to identify with self and you start to make decisions that ultimately I think empower you and move you forward in your life. And um, I, again, I just revel at your life and your career thus far and your telling of it. It's just, it's fascinating. And I think we all bring different perspectives um, to all of this that hopefully informs, but, you know, it's- But there's something about belonging that you're talking about, right? As that you felt a sense of belonging in the dance community, you felt a sense of belonging and stuff. So when you talk about identity and self, like for me, it really came from a, a, a place of like, I could, I wanted to see this, see, you know, myself on stage, you know, mm-hmm. characters that were dealing with the things that I was dealing with, things that I wanted to be able to see my mom and dad on stage. And I realized like, that's not happening very often. And you know what I mean? In terms of particularly, um, you know, representation and stuff. And so it felt like maybe I could go into the theater and actually, you know, make an impact in that way. Uh Uh I didn't mean to cut you off. Did you finish your thought? No, it's great. I think we'll keep moving on. There's lots to talk about and discuss. Well, with that, um, talk a little bit more about Woolly Mammoth and obviously what you have brought to the organization with your life and your life experience and um, how you're moving the organization forward. Yeah, Wooly. Uh, first of all, I want to tell you that the name was, you know, thought up of a list of names. I think there was a lot of drinking involved. Um, and so therefore, Wooly Mammoth was born. But it's hilarious to me that right now, Wooly Mammoths are actually getting a lot of traction in the news because people are trying to bring them back, you know, and it's, right, it's, you're right, you're right, you're right. it's so hilarious to me. It's great. Every, you know, every time I see it, like another Wooly Mammoth, maybe a Wooly Mammoth will come back to life. Um, I, uh, so Wooly Mammoth is a theater that, you know, that really specializes in new work, um, work that is attempting to, you know, push the art form, but also be somewhat provocative, somewhat, somewhat like, you know, really sort of get you to think, right, about the things that are happening. Dare I say, you know, Woolly Mammoth creates theater that is about the elephant in the room or the woolly mammoth in the room. The thing that nobody wants to to talk about or has talked about uh, yet. Um, But 
probably needs to, that, that our world needs to, that our, you know, we as human beings need to. So we have a company of artists. Uh, we have actors and designers and directors. We work with them, but we also bring in people from out of town and also within the local community. And we put on these plays. But we, uh, you know, what I also want to say is that we have lots of other jobs at Woolly Mammoth and in the theater community. So I really want to talk to everybody in the district about like, come and be a carpenter, come and be a dresser, come and, you know, do something backstage or work front of house, which is, you know, with audiences, et cetera. There are, there are lots of jobs in the theater, especially right now, because, because of the pandemic, our industry has really suffered. Um, and a lot of people were out of work. And now that we're coming back, people have left. So one of the things that I really want to want to talk to everybody about is like, you know, if you're interested in the theater, go into the theater. We need you. We want you. We want you to be a part of our community, please. Um, Wooly Mammoth, just just to give you a little tidbit, we just actually closed um, a Pulitzer Prize winning musical, one of the first musicals in a long time uh, at Wooly. It was called Strange Loop by Michael R. Jackson. And actually, it was announced that it's going to Broadway, which is like, what? Oh my God, oh my God, wow. wow. It's going to go to Broadway. It has an opening date and everything. It's going to open on April 26th. Now, it used to be that you would go, Broadway and Wooly Mammoth, that's like an oxymoronic sentence. Like, I don't even understand how that even fits together because Wooly is about risk taking and things like that. And Broadway is about sort of not taking risks. But right. I think public opinion is changing. I think things there's there's a different kind of opening. So the fact that uh, a show like Strange Loop is heading to Broadway after having a run at Wooly Mammoth is kind of amazing um, and really, really, really thrilling. So we we have a bunch of shows coming up, but I'll, I, I would love to hear about Atlas and then maybe we can talk about the stuff that we have coming up so that people yeah. can come see it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, um, <clears throat> relative to just the Atlas Performing Arts Center, we are a multidisciplinary performing arts center and many people may know or not know that the Atlas was a, a 1930s movie theater and several storefronts that served the community throughout the late 30s, 40s, 50s. And in the 60s, H Street Northeast, where we're located, was one of the epicenters of the riots after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. And um, the Atlas stayed in business for a few years after those particular riots, but then went out of business for, well, close to 30 some years until in the early 2000s, the city, together with uh, uh, private support, whatnot, earmarked the Atlas as um, a building, a place that would be created, renovated, and turned into a performing arts center to serve the community. So uh, since that time, early 2000s, Atlas opened fully open in 2006. And certainly we have a mission and a, a belief in a charter um, that art uh, is something that is vital to the development of a community and of a culture. And when you use the word impact earlier, it made me think about just the Atlas. And I always say, for me, what we do and what we present on our stages, and we'll talk a little bit more about what's coming up. Um, to me, it's all about, it's the art that also has the ability to impact, to impact our thoughts, our minds, our education, our society, our culture, and we um, and we we take it very seriously. And certainly, there's an opportunity to present art for art's sake. But what always drives me is how to present art that can have some type of impact or make a difference in someone's life, just simply because it's that powerful. And you see it; it changes people always. And so I um, I think we'll I can't know. We'll talk about it a little bit later. You know, one of the things that I'm most thankful for is when I have the opportunity to be in our lobby and whether it's pre-show, intermission or post-show and as people are coming and going, it's such a great experience, opportunity to hear people talk and hear people make comment and, and or if they happen to recognize me to say something directly to me about what they thought about the show, the performance and certainly thought about the work that is being presented here at the Atlas and what a difference it's made or how happy it's made them or, oh my God, my husband loved this or my daughter came, it just goes on and on and on. So um, 
So Atlas, certainly it's it's about creating great art um, and great art that has impact and great art that makes a difference in our community. Amen. Will you um, discuss a little bit more about your um, Peace Youth Development Program? Because oh. that just sounds like a pro, I, I was just like salivating over this. I was like, you do what? What is this? I would love, love to hear more about that. Well, a City at Peace is the name of the program, a youth development program. Basically, City at Peace is a youth program with a social justice, excuse me, social justice curriculum. And in that process, students learn about all the isms of the world, racism, sexism, adultism, uh, and looking at, again, communities, marginalized communities and individuals and how to address these isms and these unjust wrongs so on and so forth. So there's discussion that's that's taken place in a process that all of these youth go through. These are generally high school teenagers um, that go through this whole facilitation and process and their discovery of social justice and isms. Mm -hmm. But what we also do is we then lace into that work in the performing arts. So students receive training in dance, in singing, um, also in writing, writing, a script, because what ultimately happens is we empower youth voice in this process. Youth voice is then turned into an original script, actually an original musical theater performance. Oh my goodness. At the end of the school year, we present the work with the youth, um, written by the youth, directed by the youth. We also have them do all of the back back end things and the production crew, so on and so forth. So it is a an entirely youth produced and youth led production, all um, through the aspect of learning about the art and using the art as a means to continue to deeply educate themselves and everyone else on issues of of uh, issues of the day and issues that matter to so much of us. So it's um it's a program that we've uh, certainly embraced here at the Atlas since my coming on board in 2014. It did exist as its own institution prior to being here at the Atlas, um, but we've certainly brought it in because I have really thought that the work that is done by the director of our City at Peace program, Sandra Holloway, I must give a shout out to her, the work that is being done by her, yay, um, and all of the young, young adults, or we call them cast members that are part of this program, um, is really profound. And I think that when we talk about art that has impact and art that matters, this is a perfect way and a perfect thing for the Atlas to be involved in where we are creating art and this art has a message and it has a meaning and certainly impacts the lives of these young people, not for today, but well into their, their future lives and their future careers. I, I love that. I, I I have experienced a little bit of that with a program that Kristen Jackson at Woolly Mammoth runs. Here's her shout out yeah. called Connectivity. Um, she yeah. she just launched the Connectivity Core Partners program, and one of our core partners is the Arc, and um, they are in Congress Heights, and they are an amazing organization. And they have this fellowship called the I Can Fellows, where they basically show young people all of the stuff about being a technician and production and sound and sound mixing, recording and lighting and all this kind of stuff. And I just have, I, I marvel at just like these young people, <laughs> like they're amazing. Yeah. They're so, so amazing. And so they get to work on projects um, that we do with the ARC and we, we try to actually um, make sure that uh, everything that we're doing is, you know, mutually beneficial for, for both organizations. We have some other organizations who are also part of that Connectivity Core Partner Program. And for me, the key of, the key to this, which is, sounds like it's very connected to your City of Peace program, but also your resident arts partners and your community partners programs is, is that basically our success, that Woolly Mammoth success is actually tied to the success of the community around us, Absolutely. period. <laughs> God, you have spoken the words right out of my mouth. We are so insane. But yes, you know, our success great. is your success. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Wow. Well, you know, you, you mentioned partnership and, and another aspect of the Atlas is our, our resident arts partner program. We do have four core uh, 
arts organizations that are anchors here at the Atlas, which includes Mosaic Theater Company of DC. Hello uh, now, Reg Douglas. Yeah, I know. Well, welcome to Reg Douglas, who's the new artistic director at Mosaic. Uh, also, Step Africa is a resident arts partner here at the Atlas. In addition to that, Capital City Symphony, which is a community-based symphony that performs here at the Atlas, as well as Joy of Motion Dance Center. So uh, these are our core resident arts partners. And then in addition to that, we have lots of other uh, arts organizations or individuals that are really regulars here at the Atlas. And we look to certainly create a sense of togetherness, home connectivity um, throughout and across the board. Uh, you know, it's, I always say it's hard to do it alone. It's much easier and much more fun and if not much more effective to do it with others. And so I believe partnership and the desire to work together in certain creative and fun ways really, really helps to make it all happen across the board. No question. So one of the one of the things that we recently launched is actually a partnership with the Miranda family, you know, Lynn Manuel Miranda and his dad, uh -huh. Luis Miranda, his mom, Luce and others, essentially to create these these fellowships of entry level positions for backstage and um, folks that, you know, the admin offices like Essentially, it's been it's been a long time coming where we talked about actually making some access and real opportunity for young people of color in particular, those who are historically excluded to actually have the ability to not just take an internship and internship after internship and never get the job, but to actually have a full time job. And so this is when you say partnerships, I go, oh, my God. Yeah, that makes me think of it's not just to me about the, the community and the arts group. It's also about the partnerships that actually create kind of big programs that allow us to act to help the workforce mm -hmm. and develop that workforce for Washington, D.C., and also for our industries. Absolutely, I wanted to echo what you've been talking about and speaking about. I think that you know we can talk about the arts, and there's always certainly the performing arts or even the visual arts, and there's the the art of doing the work. But all of that requires support, whether it be it's the production crew, it's working yes. crew, it is it's marketing, it's development, it's fundraising, it's finance and administration. And I think yes. Um, we have been hit particularly hard relative to the pandemic, not only from our ability to present live work, but certainly it's having the skilled staff in place to actually do the work necessary. And so if we are speaking to an audience here through 202 Creates, it's to always stress that the world of art is vast and there's you can certainly do the work, do the art, but there, there is a great need for creatives on the whole other end of it, it takes a whole village to make it work. So as I celebrate the work that you're doing as far as trying to contribute to the workforce that works, certainly we're in the process of continuing to hire and continue to look for people to do a multitude of tasks here at the Atlas. So if you are interested in getting involved and doing, doing your art or getting involved in what we would call the creative economy, Institutions such as Woolly, Atlas, these are all places where you can, in many ways, get your foot in the door and start making a difference and start building your career path and learning just about the wonderful, wonderful world of art. I sometimes say the art of business, the business of art. Yeah, amen, amen, amen. Um, let's talk about what we have coming up. What you got coming up? Well, um, let me just make sure I get this all. <laughs> Uh, well, a couple of things. We are currently in production right here at the Atlas. We do have Mosaic Theater Company currently here performing with Dear Maple, which is um, their first production of 2022. Uh, and then in addition, we have Prologue Theater presenting World Builders uh, is another theatrical production that's here. So please come out, check it out. They're in, they're uh, live and they're happening. We had a great weekend this past weekend and would love to see people here for those shows. But uh, in addition to that, what we have is the Atlas's Intersections Festival. We have an annual multi-week long festival that celebrates the performing arts. And last year, on, well, in years past, um, the festival generally, we present or produce over two to three weeks, close to 60 to 70 performances and productions and events. 
Oh. Uh, last year, because of the pandemic, we did none of that. Um, and we did what we called our Atlas Arts on Air, which is a whole uh, virtual or digital uh, pre-recorded performances that we then posted online. But this year, we are back to live performances. We're doing it in a much smaller way this year um, as we build back. So I really uh, encourage people to check out our calendar for the next couple of weeks because we've got a lot that's happening here and certainly would love to welcome people back to the Atlas. Uh, we are opened and we are uh, making art happen here every day and would love to continue to bring people in and again, allow, allow them to share in the, in the magic and the beauty of live theater and live art, certainly in a very safe and responsible way. But um, that's what we've got coming up. I want to plug Intersections Festival 2022. Um, we're back and hopefully we will be uh, back again even next year in an even bigger, bigger way. It's really a very exciting time for us and an exciting way. Um, a lot of what happens with this festival is we're able to provide an entry point or the theater spaces to be accessible to a broad range of artists. We really want to cater to and embrace DC-based artists. The need for space in this city to not only to rehearse work, to present work is, is at a minimum um, and certainly or at a premium from a cost perspective. At Intersections Festival, it, there is an application that artists fill out, but um, we certainly make this opportunity to them as a way to certainly gain access to our spaces with little to no money up front whatsoever, and then an opportunity to sell tickets and generate revenue for themselves. So um, Intersections is a great for our community as far as presenting great and wonderful different art, but hopefully also it's great for our arts community by providing space for artists to do their work. I will be there. All right. <laughs> okay, Check and then you're gonna come to Woolly. And then I'm going to come to Woolies. And then you're going to come to Woolies. So what we've got coming up is a, uh, well, we did a film adaptation of this last year during the pandemic. It's called Hi, Are You Single? And this is a victory lap. This is an encore where we bring Ryan back um, to do a production. It's two and a half weeks starting in March, at the end of March into April. Um, it is literally its title. This is the Ryan Haddad, if you have watched Netflix's The Politician, he's on there. He's got a burgeoning film career, playwriting career, etc. He is a gay uh, man with cerebral palsy, and he's been trying to get a date for a long time. And he la literally sat in right outside of the bathroom at a gay bar and just said, hi, are you single to every man who went into the bathroom and every man who went out of the bathroom. And so this is like a hilarious you know, kind of beautiful, also heartbreaking show um, about him and talk about and the gay community. Um, yeah. So I hope that you will bring yourself, everybody, just to like get oh, a block of tickets and come and hang out with us. I will. I will. I, fascinating. I, we're, we're also doing another play that we were actually performing right, but right before the oh. pandemic, not performing, we were rehearsing, excuse me, right before the pandemic ended. And it's called, there's always the Hudson. It's a world premiere play by Paola Lazaro, who is the writer and uh, is the lead actor in it. Um, she is currently on the walking dead. So if you're a walking dead fan, you will know her. Um, anyway, she is amazing. And this is a piece um, that is a kind of a revenge comedy um, oh, yeah. piece. Uh -huh. And so this is, I, I, I was really intentional in terms of the curating of the season to make sure that there was a lot of comedy first, even though it's dark comedy and sort of going to hit you in the gut as well, you know, in that kind of woolly mammoth style. It's just, it's also about having a moment of release with people um, with your masks on for right. sure. But yeah. of release with people after, you know, two years to going on more of um, of this pandemic time. Yeah, I, a question um, thinking about just your season and the, the works that you presented. And I must admit, you know, hats off to you. It is the work is always compelling, always interesting, fascinating. The subject matter um, that artistic process of curating or determining works for a season how do you do that? How do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a I know, it's like a secret sauce. I know. You know, this is one of the things why I really love Woolly Mammoth, because 
I think I thank you for saying that in terms of the work being always compelling, because I think sometimes it's 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 OK to not like it. If you are walking out of a woolly mammoth play and you're talking about it and you're wanting to dissect it and discuss it. And sometimes it's a transformative experience, but sometimes you're just like, you know, what were they doing? What are they trying to, to, to make happen? Right. Then I feel like it is a successful woolly mammoth experience, you know? Um, and so I, I, uh, in terms of thinking about the kinds of theater that woolly does, it's a very actually narrow lane. Like we are not going to do Shakespeare plays. We are not going to do plays that are super popular. Let everybody else do those plays. We, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Um, if if another theater is going to do it, great. I'll just go and do the weirder one. Awesome, no problem. We're we're a theater company that um, that really um, is pursuing bold boldness in the artistry, right? And so. Um, and so to me, a lot of it has to do with what wouldn't, what, you know, what are the things that actually are uh, risk taking and are actually pushing the form and pushing people to think about things in a different kind of way. So for me, that is uh, a mix of shows that we produce. So we rehearse and put up much like Mosaic does. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but also it's a mix of shows that we present much like you all do, which is mm -hmm. taking theater companies and saying, you're going to come and you're going to show your work here. We're going to give you space and we're going to, you know, tell the world about it. And mm -hmm. so that, that uh, marriage that is, is actually really great for Wooly because it allows us to sort of home grows a lot of the work when we're producing it, but also to bring in artists from elsewhere to kind of, you know, who are so innovative and trying new things and really inspire us and, you know, and, and actually, you know, inspire the rest of our local community. So in terms of the question about picking a season, man, it is always difficult um, because, but luckily, you know, Woolly Mammoth is not a theater company that is so um, ticket price dependent Mm -hmm. We actually get a lot of funding from, thank goodness, the city. We get a lot of funding. Thank you. Thank you. We get a lot of funding from foundations and other other um, and individuals because they know that, you know, we're taking a risk and we can't necessarily um, predict if it's going to be a box office success or not. Sometimes it takes a while for something to catch on, et cetera. So it's a very big mix, but it's really always about trying to be in that lane of that mission, right? Like really yeah. actually thinking about what is boundary breaking at this moment in time. Does that make sense? Did I answer that question? Oh my God, yes. And you actually, as always, made me think of something else in the sense, <laughs> um, you know, looking at, you know, this the field, the field of art here in the District of Columbia and thinking about, how do people get into this field and, and um, get their foot in the door? I, what came into mind and in the work that Wooly does um, and what I'm always looking for too when it comes to work that gets presented on our stages is presenting things that are uniquely different. And in some ways, everyone, every artist, every individual that comes along needs to sort of determine and figure out what's different about you. Do you think um, a, a line of script on a page um, is a line of script on the page. And what has always profoundly impressed me is that giving it to this actor versus this actor versus this actor and how it can be interpreted differently. The same is for a step of dance, you know, or a movement or choreography. The artist is able to bring what is uniquely different about them to a particular role. And that's what gives them sort of that edge up. And that's what gives them that identity and that sort of creation of their own self. Same thing with playing an instrument. It's the artistry of it all. It just, um, uh, it never ceases to amaze me how every one of us, um, whereas we want to fit in or think we need to fit in, how different we are and how uniquely different we are, and certainly how the arts gives us that opportunity to celebrate who we are and to find your own path and your own way. Yeah, and find a way to bring your full self, just to yeah. go back to the beginning of this conversation. Um, I think that's what we both have wanted and have found in our respective places, which is which is an amazing thing. So mm -hmm. folks can find more about Wooly Mammoth on our website, woollymammoth.net. Now, how can folks find more about 
Atlas. About the Atlas. Well, um, more about the Atlas, certainly from our website at atlasarts.org, A-T-L-A-S-A-R-T-S dot org. And certainly on social media through Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We're out there um, promoting promoting the work that we're doing here. So certainly hope that people um, check that out. Check out Wooly. Yay. Yay. And thank you for joining us uh, for today's Mayor Muriel Bowser Presents to to Create Masterclass. To learn more, visit online at www.202creates.com or follow uh, 202 Creates on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Thank you again for joining us. It was great to talk to you, Doug. And Maria, great to talk to you. This has been wonderful. Again, everyone, thank you so very much. 